Jean McCulloch is a former managing editor of the Paris Review, a senior editor of Ten House, and the founding editorial director of Ten House Books. She is the co-founder of the Toto Santos Writers Workshop. Her work has appeared in the Paris Review, Ten House, the New York Times Book Review, Vogue, O Magazine, Allure, the Northwestern Review, and other publications. Her memoir, All Happy Families, was published by HarperCollins in 2018. She lives in Brooklyn, New York. The piece she is reading tonight is titled Snow and the Night Sky. Please help me welcome Jean. Thank you. Hi, everybody. It's an honor to be here. And those, both of those pieces were just exquisite. So I'm, I loved sitting back and hearing them all. Um, I'm going to write an essay that I just finished fairly recently. And I just wanted to say a little bit about it in the beginning. I was commissioned to write this piece for an anthology. Um, it's going to be the second anthology in a series called Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. And I'm giving it that shout out because I know you guys are going to be hosting Zibby Owens, the creator of that soon. Um, I had asked them what they wanted me to write on because often I find a little prompt can help. Uh, and they said friendship. And then I immediately regretted <laughs> that I had asked them because I, I kind of drew a blank. And all I could think of in my mind's eye as I sat down was an image of Winnie the Pooh and Piglet wandering through the thousand acre wood together. And I couldn't really come up with anything um, until I, I realized there was one person I had always, always wanted to write about. And I had really never found the form in which to do it. So I was grateful for the opportunity. So this is Snow in the Night Sky. The message was written in spidery hand on a scrap of paper ripped from a legal pad, the edges ragged. It lay on the table in an in unfamiliar kitchen held down by a coffee mug. I'd gone with my boyfriend, maybe he was already my fiance, to visit his aunt in Weekapog, Rhode Island. She lived alone in the family house and barely spoke a word to us. Though from time to time, we heard her moving along the halls upstairs, the wood creaking the uneven floorboards in the dark house as the wind blew off the sea. We were just 24. Your sister called to tell you Snow is dead. That was the message. I didn't see the lugubrious aunt again after that. I got on a train back to New York for the funeral of my best friend. Her real name wasn't Snow, it was Kathy. But Kathy didn't do justice to her flaxen blonde hair. It was just too plain a name. We tried for a long time to come up with a counterpart for me, but my red brown hair only conjured words like rust and Irish setter. For a while we tried terracotta. We liked the romantic sound of it, but it was really too much of a mouthful. Our mothers had met dropping us off at Sunday school in the local Episcopal church and bonded over the fact we'd all just arrived in New York from Europe and were beginning schools across the street from each other on the Upper East Side. Snow was going to the more conservative school where in 1968, girls wore nicks and buttons pinned in their hair ribbons. And I was going to the more progressive where we wore black armbands and canvassed the Yorktown neighborhood for social studies credit. It's been said that you do not make friends, you recognize them. What did we recognize? A way of being easy with each other, I suppose. A love of the madcap. Shaky Super 8 movie footage shows us dashing around in my family's living room wearing my mother's fur coats, the hems pedaling at our feet. 
When Snowflake the albino gorilla graced the cover of National Geographic magazine, we spent entire Saturday afternoons in white turtlenecks and ballet tights, our hair tucked in to my mother's white latex bathing caps, perched on the arms of club chairs and backs of couches, munching imaginary bananas. We invented a language and went bois, 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 that only albino gorillas could speak. On Sunday mornings, we zipped maroon choir robes over our neon striped mini dresses and fishnet tights and walked demurely up the aisle of the church, taking care not to let our chain belts clang against our hymnals as we walked. The spring we were 12, Madison Avenue opened to pedestrian traffic on Monday evenings to encourage retail and families emerged from innocuous apartment buildings to congregate in the street. Mothers in sensible shoes walked family dogs. Some smoked cigarettes. Sales girls from the cosmetic shop on 76th Street and the bakery on 73rd Street would stand on the curb offering free samples. Snow and I would watch the sky as the evening came on making our pilgrimage to Baskin and Robbins on 84th Street. She could only stay out until nightfall. So as we walked, we found names for the darkening sky. Faded denim, robin's egg blue, royal blue, brand new denim, sapphire, indigo. At indigo, we turn around. It's not technically dark yet, I'd say. I still see some blue up there. There's still some light. So we'd linger eating our cones, then slowly turn down a side street and head back to the corner of Lexington and 72nd Street to drop snow off with her doorman. In March, the city unfreezes slowly, unsteadily. Yet one day, the sun melts the piles of snow into slush and the smell of fresh earth lightly tinges the air. It was one of those March evenings. As spring began, green shoots of daffodils pushing through the frozen ground that I realized night held all the hope of possibility of our future. When you're 12 years old, you can think like that because everything seems on the brink. Our bodies were changing and high school would soon begin. I heard my mother describe this syndrome to Snow's mother one day on the phone. Get ready, our butterflies are getting ready to test their wings, she said. She meant it as a maternal warning, I realized, because she added, fasten your seatbelt. But looking back now, I realized we were becoming butterflies that spring. She was right. We were emerging slowly from cocoons, our wings still curled up against us as we planned our course of flight. We both had artistic dreams. We'd lie in bed on our weekend sleepovers and tell each other grand plans, our hands dancing in the air as we constructed futures for ourselves. I was to be a writer, she was to be a painter, and she surely would have been a gifted one. She tossed it lightly, but her talent was recognized early on. By the time she got to Yale, she was named scholar of the house in the art department. I remember at the time thinking of addiction as a big house, a house with loud music playing all the time, drowning out the sound of the phone ringing when those of us on the outside <clears throat> called. It was hectic in there, groups of damaged souls dancing and spinning into walls with chaotic euphoria. Soon after we graduated from college, snow slipped into that house quickly when I wasn't looking. Where the hell was I? Why was I not pounding on the door of the house, demanding she come out? I was on the outside somewhere, busy starting my own life living in a tiny apartment on Horatio Street 
with a tall man and a magazine job that included petty cash. In the last picture I have of Snow, she's standing with her dog, Travis, and a boy she met in art school. Her jeans are splattered with paint and rolled above her ankles. Her blonde hair is matted, cut short in uneven chunks around her face, as if she'd taken scissors to it in the dark. She had a column of rubber bands around her ankles and more on her wrists. Her car keys hung on a ribbon around her neck. The image of that chaotic house kept coming back to my mind at her funeral and at the reception after in my family's living room. I saw myself outside that house and I could not forgive myself for not looking up long enough to see her as she wafted by the window, as if that would lure her out. Even when I knew she was struggling, still I was standing outside with my hands in my pockets, staring down at the rough pavement, accepting the boundaries that she'd put up. The coroner reported pneumonia as the cause of death. And I imagine her body was so emaciated by then from heroin use that anything could have taken her out. The train rumbled through the Connecticut countryside later that day as I returned to my tall fiance waiting in Rhode Island. Slowly, the lights in the farmhouses along the route came on. The sky had faded denim blue. Still time to hang out, Snow would say. It's technically only dusk. Light lingers long in the New England summer sky. Gradually, the clouds went from lavender to ash. 10 minutes later, as we neared the New Haven station, the sky darkened to royal blue, then slowly to sapphire. Even so, there was an astonishing light that night. A profusion of stars promised clear weather ahead. There's no reason to leave yet, I was thinking. We can linger. There's so much left to do. But I was tra traveling through the New England indigo night alone. The boys of our youth, now men in their 60s, still speak of snow to me. The boy with the yellow socks, now a defense lawyer in San Francisco. The boy with the madras jacket and the buck teeth, now a screenwriter in LA, the jazz musician. As they speak, a light sparks and redirects. They're rummaging in their deep, past for a glimpse of the golden girl none of them could catch, the pale goddess of their fevered adolescent imaginations. Always they ask, did you see it coming? Did I see it coming? After 40 years, still I think of snow when I look at the darkening sky. I wondered what her art would be like if our kids would know each other, if we teach them our monkey talk, and if she suddenly appeared, what we would say. But I do know one thing. I know we'd recognize each other. That was